Okay, perfect. Um, so nice to meet everyone. And thank you, Leah. And thank you, Anne, for inviting me to come chat with the group. Um, I love seeing everyone's faces. Uh, this is my first time doing this. So um, I would love it to be as interactive as possible. I thought I would start by sharing a little bit about Lazy Dog, which is the company that I work for. Um, and then I'll share a little bit about some of the things um, and the initiatives that we've done throughout COVID as we were kind of working through uh, crisis and then kind of wrap up with some key takeaways and answer any questions that you have. So um, I'm gonna try to show you a video first and I'm hoping it works. Um, I trust you'll tell me if you can't hear it. Um, so I thought I would, I, I guess, let me ask this, maybe a show of hands or I don't know if you, everyone is muted, but has anyone been to Lazy Dog? Is there anyone on that knows? Okay, good. So it looks like there's a few of you that are familiar with Lazy Dog. Um, I think that as, as I think about, you know, what we've done over the past eight months, right? And as COVID hit and how did we use innovation to help us actually not just survive the crisis, but actually thrive in it. Um, a lot of it has to do with just who we are and our culture and what we're about. So I thought it would be fun to start by showing you a little bit about who we are. So I'm hoping that this works. Please let me know if for some reason you can't hear. Can you guys see the screen okay? I want our guests in the restaurants to feel the warmth and care that I feel when I when I come to the Rocky Mountains. When I when I come here in the summer, the valley is is just alive. It's the incredible smell of the pines. It's the thousand shades of green. It's the sounds of the creek running by. It's long drives on two lane roads. It's time with friends and family around the campfire. I spend this summer in the Rocky Mountains because I'm able to disconnect from the hustle and bustle and stress of, of normal everyday life. It is a simpler way of life and I think it puts people in just this different state of mind that creates a, a population that's just a lot more relaxed. You know, a great sense of community. You know, I think they're, they've got their priorities pretty well, pretty well balanced. Lazy Dog, I met you last year. My goal in creating the Lazy Dog concept was to, to bring a slice of the Rocky Mountains to to our guests. You know, that, that connection with, with the community, the connection with your friends and your and your family that, that, that you get when you're in a small mountain town. I also want them to, to get a little bit of the adventure, that kind of the thrill of, of trying something new. In the mountains, because everybody is very active, because they're always outside, whether, whether you're working the ranch as a cowboy or whether you're climbing mountains as a climber or a skier, People are very conscious about what they put in their bodies, and so therefore they make sure that the things that they eat and drink are, are very carefully sourced and, and handcrafted. And, and so that's another theme that you know, that I brought to, to Lazy Dog. We make sure everything's handmade and, and sourced with care so that uh, people can again kind of trust what they're putting in their bodies. Escaping to the Rocky Mountains gives all of us this, this reset button that we're able to rejuvenate ourselves, refresh ourselves, kind of get back to what is, is really the, the, the greatest meaning in life, and that's just getting together and being together as a family. Our founder and CEO, Chris Sims, and he was really talking about, um, you guys can hear me okay still? Perfect. Okay. Um, you know, he was talking about what inspired Lazy Dog and, you know, what we're about. And Chris comes from a, uh, 
you know, three generations of restaurateurs. And as a kid, you saw that video is actually in Jackson Hole. He grew up going to Jackson Hole with his family. And it was really the small town vibe, the Rocky Mountains that inspired him and, and the food and the conversations that took place kind of fireside around the table that inspired Lazy Dog. And so that is the inspiration for who we are and what we do. Um, so let me pull up my other presentation. Can you guys see that now? Okay, the slides? Yes, except we see presenter mode. We don't, okay. we don't see just this one. Let's see this one. Okay, share. Sorry, let me try again. How do I make it? Let's try from current slide. Same thing. Okay, hold on one second. Well, I guess I could just do this and scoot this over, right? How's that? Can you guys see that okay? Okay, so, um, and I'll try to move this over there. So when we think about Lazy Dog, and this, this slide really tells you kind of who we are and what our purpose is, right? Our purpose is really to nourish connections with our teammates, our guests, and our communities. And we really see ourselves as the next generation of casual dining. Um, and so we've got really three components that we focus on to begin with. One, you know, food, atmosphere, and then experience. And for us, food is all about just really loving the food, um, sharing new and unexpected with foodies and drinks and experiences that inspire our guests to try something new. Uh, it's all handcrafted. Um, the atmosphere, if you go into the Lazy Dog, I saw a lot of hands raised there that if you go into our restaurant, what you'll hopefully notice and feel is that small town hospitality vibe. And it's kind of looks a little bit like a mountain lodge. And that's intentional because we're trying to make it feel like when you escape to the mountains, if you're on a vacation or if you're somewhere other than, you know, the hustle and bustle of the day to day. And then from an experience standpoint, we're all about making sure that our guests and our teammates feel like they're part of the family. We want it to feel like this is an extended family. We want you to come and join uh, your friends and family, sit around the table and just enjoy the food and good conversation. And then as far as communities go, it's really important to us and it really always has been that we are part of our community. And as we go through kind of the few slides I wanted to share with you today, that was one of the things that actually ended up being a really big strength for us as we um, were challenged to kind of navigate through the coronavirus and all the challenges that that brought with, with the restaurant industry. And it was really being grounded in our purpose and this, which is who we are, that as you'll see really got us through um, the last seven months. So that's kind of who we are as a restaurant. The second piece of it, that is a really important piece that again, um, is just a big part of who we are is we have a really strong people focused culture. And what that means is that we believe that one of the things that differentiates a great company from a good company is really a culture that feels more like a family than a place to work. And so everything that we do, everything we've always done and continue to do is really looked at through that lens. We believe that, um, that, that before customers can love a company, that the teammates really have to love that company. And so we focus on that very specifically and very intentionally. So that's a little bit about kind of who Lazy Dog is, was pre-COVID, right? And then this happened, right? COVID hit, I think mid-March and everything came to a screeching halt. And like many other companies, we closed indoor dining. Um, we furloughed the vast majority of our teammates. Uh, when, when COVID hit, I think we had about 5,000 teammates. We furloughed about 98% of them in that moment because our restaurants were closed. Um, and we also at that time didn't have a really strong takeout business. If you've been to a Lazy Dog, we have a pretty big box. So from a square footage standpoint, our restaurants are much larger than many restaurants. And it's because 
our focus has always been on the in-restaurant dining experience and creating that vibe, that small town hospitality that I talked about, that really was where we focused. And so we were actually positioned probably a little bit worse off than many restaurants because we didn't have a really strong takeout business. It just wasn't a huge focus of ours up to that point. So we began thinking about and talking about what are the ways that we can serve our communities? What are the ways that we can help? And we started innovating in all kinds of ways. And it started, you know, here are some of the things we did. So first of all, some very fundamental things is we created a new platform for online ordering. Uh, we didn't have that before. We made it mobile friendly. There was a lot of um, technology components of that to get that up and running in you know, a couple of weeks so we could start doing takeout a little bit more efficiently. We created a whole other strategy around curbside pickup so that it was a frictionless experience for our guest. Right. If you remember when COVID hit, nobody wanted, nobody knew, should I touch that person? Do I need to wear gloves? Is it transmitted on the surface? And so there was this whole strategy around how do we make sure you can drive up? We created drive up lines. Somebody, you know, open your trunk. We won't even come near you. We'll put the food in your trunk. We'll close your trunk and, you know, you can pay online and we'll make it so it's basically contactless for the guest. And then the other thing that we really had to focus on just foundationally was the packaging. Um, up to that point, like I said, you know, to go and, and off premise wasn't a significant part of our business. And so we needed packaging that was a little bit sturdier. We needed packaging that kept the heat in the right way so that when you got the food home, it wasn't all, you know, steamed and, and soggy. And so right off the bat, this is the first thing we did is we kind of focused on, on these three things. And then we started getting into the really fun stuff. So if you think back, it feels like oh, so long ago, but, you know, late March to May in terms of what was happening, um, you know, the first thing is we created this home essentials pack. And what that was is if you remember at that time, there was a point of time when the grocery stores were overwhelmed and inundated and it was difficult to get simple things like eggs and bread and potatoes and rice and milk and toilet paper, right? And so we created these home essentials where because restaurants have a different supply chain than the grocery stores, we had this stuff, right? We had it, our restaurants were closed, we knew our communities needed it. And so at very little margin or cost to, to, the, to the guests, we basically started selling these home essential kits. So you could come in and we would give you a loaf of bread, 18 eggs, potatoes, rice, carrots, and just some raw food. And, and you got two rolls of toilet paper because at that point there was a shortage of that, but we had plenty. So that was one of the things we did. And then we offered meal kits. And this was interesting because as COVID continued to go on and there was the stay at home order, you know, everybody was cooking, right? So at first they needed this, they needed the eggs, the bread, the potatoes. And then what happened shortly after for many, including me is everybody got really sick of grocery shopping and cooking. And I, I don't know how to cook. I'm having a difficult time coming up with ideas of what I should make. Um, Cause at that point, all the restaurants were still closed. And so we created these meal kits and there were I think like four or five of them. This one that I'm showing you here is a barbecue kit that we created. Uh, and I, it was just in time for like Father's Day. So we gave you all of the ingredients. And I mean, all of the ingredients from the condiments to everything you could possibly need. We had a barbecue kit, we had a pizza kit, all these fun kits that you could come purchase just so you didn't have to think about what you were gonna make for your family. And they were family size meal kits. And that was really popular. And then, um, the minute we could start adding on alcohol, like many we did, right at one point, uh, the state of California said you can add and you can sell alcohol to go because, by the way, prior to COVID, that was not legal. You weren't able, you, you couldn't sell alcohol to go. So we started doing that as an add on. And then we got into this really fun stuff. These are, um, I don't know if you can tell from the picture, but these are handmade Pop Tarts. So the other thing, that we learned as we talked to our community and to our guests and we knew what was going on is that, you know, parents were at home, kids were not in school, people were bored, they needed something to do. And so we wanted to figure out how can we help the parents and what can we do for the, for the kids that'll be really fun. And so we created these kits, we gave you the dough and all of the ingredients and you can make your own little uh, homemade uh, pop tarts here. And the kids loved doing it. It was super fun, a ton of engagement. So basically with this pantry, what we really did is just whatever was going on at that time, our biggest focus and our biggest, um, the lens that we were looking through was all about what do the communities need? 
Um, it's always been important to us that we're part of the communities and when they were struggling, we wanted to help and we wanted to give them anything we could. So those were some of the fun things we did late March and May as um, COVID hit. And then the next one we did here was really, really exciting and something that we're just so proud of. Uh, you, you may recall thinking back around the same time, like May, June timeframe, um, the healthcare workers, the first responders, everybody was overwhelmed, hospitals were getting inundated. And so we created this uh, promotion where we created a uh, family meals and it was basically like a one decision family meal takeout solution. So unlike the kits I just showed you that needed to be prepared when you came home, that these were all ready to go. But basically it's a family meal, uh, chicken, green beans, mashed potatoes, and you can just bring it home and sit around. But what was great about it is we did a buy a meal and we'll donate one. And so what that meant is that for every family meal that was purchased, we donated a meal to all of the first responders. And here's a few of the pictures. And so these were people that were working, you know, 18, 24 hour shifts. They were at that point, you know, not going home to see their family because they were taking care of COVID patients. And so in hospitals and um, first responders all around our restaurants, we reached out and we basically donated 34,000 meals to our first responders in that time. And it was amazing. It, the, the, amazing thing about it was our teammates that were working and our management team were so proud of this initiative that they were just happy to be at work, happy to participate. Um, so at that point in time, you know, that's what the first responders needed. They needed to be fed. They, you know, were working long shifts. And so again, just one more thing that we were really doing to make sure that we were paying attention to what was going on in our communities and trying to be a partner with them and do what we could to help them get through. And then most recently, I don't know if any of you guys have seen this. Has anyone seen or tried the TV dinners by chance? Jacob, I see a hand there, okay. So um, this was really fun uh, because this is something that we had talked about. I think I said in the beginning that a lot of these strategies are things that at one point we had had a conversation about as a leadership team, but you know, we had them spaced out over the next you know, couple of years. And what, what COVID really did is it just forced us to kind of accelerate and bring all of these initiatives forward into 2020. Um, but this has been a really fun initiative. And so as we anticipated continuing to have limited capacity, right? Restaurant, dining rooms opened, they closed, they opened, they closed. And I don't know if anyone heard Governor Newsom today, but they closed again today in restaurant dining, uh, went back and now it's patio only. And um, every county that we're in, but I think 41 counties today. So there's only very few counties that, that have in, in restaurant dining. But as we anticipated that and the closures, you know, coming back and forth, we really wanted something that we could continue to grow the off-premise business, right? So we launched these TV dinners, which are pre-prepared, frozen, single-serve entrees that guests can take home with them and then reheat another day. And I don't know if there's anyone um, here that was around when the original TV dinners came out. I was, I admit it, um, but it looks very much like these. It was this ten foil, like hungry man-ish uh, TV dinners that were super popular at the time. But the amazing thing about these is they're made scratch every day. These are our favorite menu items that our guests love. So when you're in the restaurant and you order the fish and chips and that's your favorite thing, you can also get a frozen TV dinner to take home and enjoy that you know, later in the week and they have been wildly successful. Um, but for us, from an innovation standpoint, we knew that people were continuing to work from home. We knew that they were homeschooling kids, in many cases, while they were working. Um, and so we wanted to offer something in addition to the family meals and the takeout that we were doing, um, which, but without sacrificing the quality. And if you've tried these, um, you will see that they're, they're huge. So from a value standpoint and from a portion standpoint, I would say that almost oh, everyone has a head. To, one of these feeds two people. I mean, so from a value standpoint, it's ten dollars. So it's a great opportunity for us in the restaurant when someone's dining to say, hey, you want to take home a couple of TV dinners to enjoy next week? Um, and it's been a huge success. Our TV dinners, the... Uh, profit and, and the, the sales and the revenue that are coming from just our TV dinners are the equivalent of an entire additional restaurant for us. 
we've actually started, we have 39 restaurants and we've started calling TV dinners restaurant number 40 because it is doing that well. And, and it's just, it's meeting the guest where they are at at that point in time, depending on what's going on in their life. And then it's being able to do it quickly, right? We're very good at pivoting quickly and then getting something out that they love. Um, and so this has been a really fun thing to, to see um, take off. And then I didn't have a chance to um, add it in this presentation because I put this together last week and, and we just launched it. But has anyone heard uh, by chance of Jolene's Wings and Beer by Lazy Dog? It's brand new. Um, but basically, we just launched last week, Wednesday, it went live, uh, a ghost kitchen concept. And so what that is, is um, it's by Lazy Dog and it's wings and beer and you can order salads as well, but it's a complete ghost kitchen. It's takeout only. It's available on, you know, Grubhub, DoorDash, all the takeout partners. And, uh, you know, day number one, already $12,000 in sales. So annualized, you know, once that starts to grow, you know, we believe Jolie's, Jolene's Wings and Beer by Lazy Dog is going to be another restaurant for us. So we are creating these uh, ways that we can continue to engage with and support the communities and the guests um, that don't require in restaurant dining because we anticipate that probably this open close, open close is, is going to continue to ebb and flow at least uh, I would say Q1, Q2 of next year is, is sort of what we're anticipating. So if you haven't tried the TV dinners or the Jolene's wings and beer and you like wings and beer, I would strongly recommend you try it. Um, but those are some of the things that we've done all in the last you know, few months. And it's been interesting because when I was getting ready, oh, sorry, one more that I forgot to share is the, um, the family meals. So I think I shared early on that we created the family meals and we did the buy one, you know, we'll donate one. Most recently we added to that additional um, family meals packaging, um, but we also included our handmade uh, sauces. So we make our own condiments in restaurant for everything. We have our own hot sauce, our own ketchup, our own uh, IPA mustard sauce. And now when you order a family meal as a surprise and delight, you get Lazy Dog's homemade uh, condiments with it as well. So um, it's just a great way to continue to uh, be part of the community and, and feed our guests. Um, but what was interesting is I was thinking about, you know, this and I, I kind of went back and thought to myself, okay, what were the things we did, right? Like what were the common threads that I think attributed to our success throughout COVID? And um, it really uh, comes back to our teammates. Um, you know, I said at the beginning that our culture is a really strong culture. We really believe in taking care of our teammates, but through, throughout COVID, um, we took really good care of our teammates. And we did that at a time that it would have been really easy not to, right? There are a lot of companies out there that, um, you know, laid off people. Um, they protested, contested their unemployment. Um, we went above and beyond to make sure that we were taking care of our teammates who were furloughed. You know, like I said, at one point we had 5,000 teammates and about 98% of them were on furlough. And then as the restaurants began to reopen, we began bringing people back. But that entire time that they were furloughed, we did a lot of things that many companies didn't do. And I'll share this one that I have up on the screen with you. We have what we call um, the Lazy Dog Care Fund. And it is a teammate funded emergency assistance program. And so what that means is that um, when you work for Lazy Dog, you have the option to opt in to a payroll deduction and have it take out pre-tax money that goes into this, it's actually a, um, a nonprofit organization, it goes into this charity fund for Lazy Dog teammates. Some people put in, I kid you not, a dollar a paycheck. Some people put in $20 a paycheck. And a lot of people don't put in anything. It's completely optional if you feel like you want to help. But this has been a big strength for us during COVID because we've helped 29 teammates who were otherwise in a very challenging situation during COVID, whether it was because they tested positive themselves and were very sick, whether it was because they had medical bills, whether it was because a family member of theirs um, was very sick due to COVID and they had a hard time you know, working or they were a caregiver for somebody. Um, and we gave, we've given them money. So at a time when a lot of companies you know, weren't able to do anything, we were fortunate that we have so many engaged teammates doing things like this. But this is really just one example of what we did. 
we maintained our benefit coverage for all of our teammates while they were on COVID for three months. Um, we communicated weekly with our furloughed teammates. So rather than just out of sight, out of mind, we sent out constant videos, email communication. We have a, um, a uh, Instagram account that is set up specifically for just our internal teammates. We were constantly communicating messages on there, helping them with unemployment, making sure they had all the resources they needed. Um, we didn't contest unemployment claims. If somebody wasn't comfortable coming back to work, even though we had called them back, we said, no problem, call us when you're ready, we'll still be here and you know, take care of yourself in the meantime. Um, and I, I think that because we did that, when dining rooms began to open up and our guests started coming back in, our teammates were incredibly engaged. They were so proud of the work that Lazy Dog had been doing. Some of the things that we were introducing, even like our furloughed teammates, you would see them on social media talking about the pantry packs and how proud they were of the company that they worked for, even though they were furloughed. And I think that went a long way because as guests came in, they felt that, right? Our teammates were engaged. They were proud of what Lazy Dog was doing. Um, but one of the other uh, sort of unexpected positive things that happened from that is when we reopened our dining rooms and we started inviting people back, for the most part, people were, wanted to come back. They missed Lazy Dog and they were happy to be back. And at that time, I had heard from a lot of other companies and restaurants that they struggled getting their people to come back. Um, they had a hard time staffing and, and people had moved on, found other jobs and, and or you know, didn't want to return. And I'm sure in part, maybe because of the way they felt like the company treated them during the process. And we really went, it was a big priority for us to go above and beyond and take care of, right, our family, our lazy dog family. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that the innovation and some of the fun things we offered were absolutely critical. But I think probably more importantly, it was our teammates and the way that we treated them and how proud they were to work at Lazy Dog um, that made a big difference for us. And so if I think back to, you know, as I was kind of getting ready to think about like this and, and some key takeaways, um, where I kind of landed is that it was really our mindset that helped us thrive during good times. So pre-COVID, right? Um, that made us strong and resilient during the crisis, right? So I don't think you could have flipped a, shit, a, a switch if you weren't already in this frame of mind in terms of how you see your guests, your communities that you're in, and your teammates. Um, but it was those things that actually helped us be really resilient during, during the crisis. And so, you know, the first thing there is we really did, we focused a lot and talked a lot about we want to do things that benefit us, of course, the company, but also benefit our teammates and our guests and the communities that we're in. So every initiative that I just shared with you kind of went through that lens of, is this meeting our higher purpose, right? Do we feel good about supporting the communities? A lot of those things we probably could have done slightly differently would have resulted in maybe a little bit more revenue in the moment for us, but we thought it was important to give back to the communities and support them in whatever they were going through as well. And then the second bullet point, which is one of our core values, is never settle. And, you know, I would say Lazy Dog has a culture, everybody, of never settling. So we expect surprises. And when change happens, we embraced it. Um, instead of focusing on what already happened, we were always looking for ways to do something new. We didn't really fixate on what other companies were doing. Um, we, we were just so focused on the larger vision and what we were trying to do to be a good part of our community and, and take care of our teammates in the meantime. Um, and I think that helped. And then um, trust as a foundation was, I think, a really big thing. That also is one of our core values, but it really rings true because I think when COVID hit, um, our teammates trusted us to take care of them, right? They trusted us when we said, we're sorry, we have to furlough you, but we'll call you back when we can and we'll take care of you in the meantime with benefits. They trusted us to do that. But I think our communities and our guests also trusted us. They trusted us that we were providing them a safe environment when they could come back to either the patio or in restaurant. They trusted us to donate the meal that they had purchased and that it would go where we said it was gonna go, which was to our first responders. And so I think that having that foundation of trust as a company and having that be a really uh, important core value for us and, and how we do things and how we, we um, react to things 
was really an important component of why were we strong throughout you know the crisis of COVID and the continuing crisis of COVID, right? Because we're not through it yet. Um, and then the last point there is really the power of and. Um, a lot of companies and a lot of leaders, right? You'll hear them talk about things in a way that suggests they believe that you either can have you know, a strong balance sheet and profits, or you can take care of your people, right? And we believe that you can do both of those, right? Which is kind of the power of and. We believe you can have strong profits and a strong balance sheet and provide a good culture and take care of your people. And so it's for that reason, when we balance those two together, that we end up with initiatives that I think served our communities well and our guests, but also served our teammates well. And I think the combination of those things has been really what has allowed us to not just survive COVID, but thrive. Uh, we actually think we are going to come out of COVID stronger than we were as a company before we went into COVID, which is you know sort of amazing. And um, we'll keep coming up with new and innovative ways to meet the needs of our communities and our guests and our teammates. Um, and every time we do, maybe that equals another restaurant and if in restaurant dining stays closed, you know, for another six months or ebbs and flows between, you know, opening and closing, um, we're going to be just fine. Um, and so I'll leave you with this kind of, you know, last quote, and then I'll open it up for any questions that you guys have. But um, this really, this is one of my personal favorite quotes, but I also see that it's how we do business at Lazy Dog, which is why I'm here and why I love what I do. Um, but happy employees ensure happy customers and happy customers ensure happy shareholders. But it has to happen in that order, right? And so it goes back to what I said in the beginning, if your employees don't love the company, your guests are never going to love the company. And so we look at things through that lens and so far it has um, helped us and um, allowed us to be very successful on that front. And with that, we are getting ready to um, kick off our new restaurant development again, which is a little bit unheard of right now, but we were opening restaurants pre-COVID. We opened one during COVID. Um, and now we've got another one on the list coming in uh, Boca Raton in uh, June, July. So that's a little bit about, you know, Lazy Dog and kind of what we've done over the past six to seven months and how I think it has helped us not just survive, but thrive in um, the world of COVID. So I'd love to just open it up and see what questions you guys have. Thank you. Uh, we had we have quite a quite a lot of fans out there of your meal kits. Um, oh, especially good. The, especially the enchiladas, apparently. Are. <laughs> the enchiladas <laughs> is the favorite. We just introduced uh, two new ones. Uh, chicken Parmesan is new, which wasn't in the slide. And then we have a, a more kid-friendly chicken nugget macaroni and cheese one as well. Well, I, I uh, got your pizza kit at one point and it was yeah. amazing. So <laughs> I can attest to that. So uh, if you'd like to either leave a question in the chat or unmute yourself and ask, um, if you'd like to be brave, uh, we'd love to have, have questions. We have time for about 20 minutes worth of questions. Um, oh, I have a question. Thank you. Go ahead, Valerie. So I, I, I'm close to the Corona location. Mm -hmm. And um, I just got a question. Do you guys have to have a permit to serve on the parking lot or how does that work? Yeah, great question. So um, pre-COVID, yes, you would not have been allowed to expand dining out into the parking lot, food or drink. Uh, I don't remember exactly when it was. It was probably late March, maybe early April, that the governor and each county slowly started allowing that. We did have to go to each landlord uh, who owns the property, property management, and get approval. Um, but they've all been, it's amazing how flexible they have been. Um, I mean, some of our landlords have actually built fences for us and um, come out to help us. None of that would have happened pre-COVID, but now they have approved that as an exception so that you can serve both food and alcohol um, in the parking lot. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And we're hoping it stays. <laughs> we're, not, we're not planning on giving that back anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Kaylin has a question. She says, how is your new location during COVID? Um, you know, um, it, it's interesting. Uh, 
it's doing good. I mean, it uh, it's in a new market for us. So it was in uh, Virginia and we only had one other restaurant there, but it opened to the dining rooms being closed. It opened to patio only. Um, Virginia has been a little bit up and down and a little bit, strangely enough, more strict at times than California. So considering uh, that for much, many of its months that it's been open, it's been patio only, it's doing great. Oh, we have a question from Melissa. How many of these new things do you think will remain? Oh no. How many of these new things do you think will remain permanent even after going uh, back to normal? Restaurants go back to being busy on the inside. Yeah, you know, great question because, you know, you saw that the first four or five things we did, the pantry packs, the meal kits, the pop tarts, the pizza kit that Ann mentioned, we, we've sunsetted all of those things. Um, and it's because they no longer were as needed. Like once the grocery stores stocked back up, people could get toilet paper. And so we, you know, we stopped doing those things. I think the ones that will probably stay long beyond COVID would be um, the frozen dinners, the TV dinners. People just seem to love them because it truly is better than anything you can get as a frozen meal in the grocery store. Um, and then I think the second one, uh, the, um, the uh, wings and beer, I think absolutely could stay because that's takeout only. And that's catering very specifically to somebody who wants wings and beer delivered. And and then the third one, which I didn't mention because we actually introduced this pre-COVID, but we also have a uh, beer club membership program. And this was something that we had introduced pre-COVID, um, but it's actually done amazing during COVID. I mean, you're reading, you're hearing all the stuff that people are drinking more, eating more, right, during COVID. So our beer club program is benefiting from that. But um, because our beers are, we, they're proprietary to Lazy Dog, we brew them, we partner with a brewery at Melvin. And you can only get some of these beers at Lazy Dog and people love that. So that's attached to the wings and beer program. So I think that will stay. Um, so, you know, if half of them stay, fantastic. We're okay with both. The short-term ones that kind of help the community and, and the company at the same time, and, and then the long-term ones. Great, thank you. We have a question from Jacob. Uh, from your experience, uh, how do you enter corporate leadership roles such as yours with Lazy Dog? Do you start working operational roles initially prior to transitioning to your current position? Um, I would say that it always is beneficial to work in an operational role. Um, I think that if you can understand the business operations first and foremost, it'll help you no matter where you go and what you do at any level. Uh, I don't think you have to do that. Um, I did not, I've never, before entering the restaurant industry, I had never worked in restaurants. Um, and so my first HR job with restaurants was actually with um, Fleming's Prime Steakhouse and Wine Bar. And I remember at that time thinking, hmm, this is going to be really like interesting because I don't really understand, I don't know restaurants all that well. I never worked in a restaurant you know, throughout high school or college, like a lot of people did. Uh, and honestly, it, it didn't really matter. People are people. And so for me in my role, right, being in kind of the HR role, um, I actually found it beneficial to have multi-industry experience. So I don't think you have to have operational experience, but I think anytime you can come from operations and understand the business, you're going to be better in, in whatever role you end up taking. Kevin asks, did you have any issues with um, LA County initially had shut down several restaurants for operating without a grocery permit for your home essential kits. Did you run into any issues with public health officials? We did not. Um, in fact, we found the uh, LA County was pretty strict on a lot of fronts. Like they were, I think the one county that required masks and face shields, like they were actually pretty strict on a lot of fronts. But honestly, we found most of the government agencies, whether it was the local health department, you know, dealing with COVID and contact tracing or OSHA coming in, um, we found most of them to be incredibly supportive and collaborative. I think at the end of the day, as long as you were doing things the right way, they were kind of happy with you. And the few visits we had, either from a health department or a local government agency, uh, they were really impressed with how we were doing things. And it was all positive. So no, we didn't have any issues with the grocery permit thing. Um, I have Robert giving um, a high five over to your Westminster property for takeout. He says it's amazing. Oh, good. Um, everything there is, is wonderful. That is the original Lazy Dog, by the way, if you did not know that. That is the very first one. Um, uh, and then Barbara Jean asked, did you have to retrain the front of house um, workers in regards to guest service? 
Um, you mean like after coming back with the COVID rules and everything? Yes, yes. absolutely. Um, you know, it was interesting. We had two kind of really interesting shifts. Um, the first one was when we furloughed our, our teammates when, when they first shut everything down and there was a stay at home order, we kept our management team intact. Like our strategy was we wanted to keep our managers as much as we could whole. But what ended up happening as a result of doing that is it was our managers that were working the line and doing the cooking and what, you know, what, what little takeout we did have or the pantry packs or whatever we were offering. And so at that moment, we had to retrain our management team how to like do those things because they hadn't, some of them had never done it. And those that had done it before, they'd not worked the walk station or they'd not cooked or been on the line in, in many cases in years. And so it was interesting. That was the first time we kind of said, okay, we need to stop and like retrain our entire management team how to do this. And then the second time was when we did bring everybody back, there were so many differences um, around the cleaning, the sanitation, you have to wear the mask, stand six feet apart. What do you do if a customer doesn't want to wear the mask? I mean, there was, we had an entire training section and welcome back orientation focused specifically on this is what we're doing under COVID to include, uh, you know, we have people take symptom surveys every day electronically. They have to log into an app and take a daily symptom survey before they come into work, get a green check, then they can come in. So there were so many things <laughs> COVID related that we had to train people on. And it was interesting because if you're in the middle of it, everybody that kind of worked through it, kind of, it was like second nature. But then there was this large population of people that had been at home bored and, you know, didn't really understand all of the things that had put in, put in play. And I don't know if any of you guys saw like the restaurant opening guide that the, the California Restaurant Association put together, but it basically provided guidance on how you could reopen in a safe way. And I'm telling you, it was like 20 pages long of all the things you have to do to make sure that it's, that's, that it's a safe and healthy environment. So short answer is yes, a lot, <laughs> a lot of extra training. Thank you. And then we have a question from the group. Did you want to unmute yourself, Michaela? Oh, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, hi. Um, so my biggest concern is, because Lazy Dog has been probably one of the companies I've been circling around trying to get into prior on my graduation. So with your response of your um, employees that were furloughed, how many of them actually came back and what are your guys' plans for new hires in the future? Yeah, uh, we are hiring. Uh, interestingly enough, we're we're busy and we are continuing to hire. Um, I, we, the last time I checked, so I think I said pre-COVID we had about five thousand employees, right? Um, last maybe three four weeks ago, last time I looked, I think we only had a couple of hundred people in total uh, out of that five thousand that were still on furlough. And um, as we dug into the reason for that, because it's not that we don't necessarily have the hours, um, these were people that opted to wait. They didn't feel comfortable coming back or they had you know, kids at home or, um, so we've pretty much brought almost everyone back who wants to be back. Um, now with dining rooms closing as of today, we'll see what that looks like from a scheduling standpoint. Uh, but the good news is, you know, unlike when, when COVID first hit and we had pretty much you know, very little off-premise or patio dining. Now, if you've been to any of the restaurants, including ours, we have so many tents and we're taking up half the parking lot. We actually have a lot of capacity outside our restaurants. So um, yeah, I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Lazy Dog and, and any company is always looks for good people. So you're good. Thank you. Uh, Tyler has a comment, says ops to home office is a fun adventure. <laughs> is that from firsthand knowledge? <laughs> um, Gloria asks, can you talk us through the development of your frozen meal kits? Are the recipes exactly the same? What about freezer space? Um, yeah, so the recipes are the same. The only thing we tweaked a little bit um, are the desserts. So, you know, it, it's funny when you're making a frozen dinner and it's like one tray, right? Everything has to cook at the same time. And so the, you know, the main course itself, like you can get our fish and chips, that's, that's the same. It's potato chips instead of French fries. Um, and then some of the desserts we created, we had to create specifically for that TV dinner. It wasn't a dessert that we already offered necessarily because we needed everything to cook at the same time. So a little bit of a tweak with, with some of the sides or the desserts, but the main course itself is, is pretty much the same. Um, freezer space was an issue. Um, but e even that, like the preparation of it. So 
they're pretty big. I mean, I'm showing you, but, but they're not small TV dinners. I mean, when, when I said they're hearty, they are hearty. Like I eat a lot and I can eat only half of one. Like I'll share one with my husband. And so the, the tray themselves, they are pretty big. Um, so we did have some, some freezer concerns early on. We were able to work through it, but the bigger <laughs> thing was kind of prepping them. Like we didn't have the, the line set up, right, to prep. 50 TV dinners. And so we've moved things around. We've gotten rid of the pizza station. We've figured out ways to, you know, get it done. Um, and it's been fine. Thank you. Anna asks, has your menu changed much to accommodate different dietary restrictions such as gluten-free, vegan, vegetarian, or do you plan to add more options like this in the future? Yeah, we do. We actually have quite a few of those options. Um, sometimes you, you, you have to ask because there is a separate menu depending on what you're looking for. But even pre-COVID, we started doving into a lot of the uh, vegetarian and vegan dishes. Like we rolled out the, uh, I think the most popular one that we rolled out pre-COVID was the um, spaghetti and beet balls, which is a vegetarian meal and did re really well. We have a, a portobello mushroom that did really well. So yes, we, we do have quite a few of those options and it is something that we are continuing to focus on. Emily would like to build on that question. And she says, what is the process for choosing the items that go into the TV dinners? Um, a lot. <laughs> I think that um, the, the first lens that we look through is what do our guests like? Like what's most popular, right? So like the pot roast on our, on our real menu is one of the most popular things people love. There's like, you know, fan favorites. Um, so we tried to start with the fan favorites, things that we know customers like. Um, which is where we landed with kind of the first set. And then really a lot of it had to do with trial and error and testing and does it cook well? And again, like I said, matching everything up so it all cooks at the same time, that is actually a unique challenge that is unique to TV dinners. So that drove it as well. Um, but we tried to stay focused towards the things that we think were the customer favorites that they would have wanted to order and, and take home. Like the pot pie is a really popular one that's on there. So we started there and then that dwindled down based on what we could get to cook well, along with everything else in the same tray. Are, are all your TV dinners offered in all your locations? They are now, yeah. Now they may, you know, I think on occasion I've been in and asked for something specific and they happen to have run out of it that day, but for the most part, yes, they're all available in all locations. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I also had another question if possible. Yes, please. Okay. So um, for my particular company that I work with, they kind of dropped the ball when it came to retraining and sanitation levels. So I know you touched bases on it just a little bit, but um, did you guys end up doing like private contractors to clean and sanitize your locations or did you utilize the employees you had? Um, that way you maximize like your employees instead of like catering like the, like facilitating out work? Yeah. You know, great question. We explored both options and we ultimately landed on keeping it in-house. What we found as we explored both options is that we probably can do it better because we know our chemicals, we know our restaurants. So we felt like we could do it better ourselves than outsourcing it. Um, we did add a position. So we added a position that was there all the time that was doing nothing but cleaning and sanitation. So we added a kind of, you know, head count at all times. So there was always someone who just did nothing but that and they just rotated around. Um, but we, we kept it in-house and um, it's gonna ruin our tables. We're gonna have to replace the finishing on our tables because the, the chemicals are so strong, but we, we, we felt like that was really important to make it a healthy and safe environment, you know, both for our teammates and for our guests. So we, we did quite a bit around that. Thank you. And Ben, did you have a question? I think Ben DeWald was queuing up a question. No, not yet. All right, anybody mm -hmm. else? Oh, you're on mute, Ben. <laughs> I love watching him. Um, <laughs> any any other questions from from the from the from the from ever anybody? I I have one. So given the announcements that came out today and what we expect to see in the next week or so, um, looks like a whole new shutdown is in process. So how are you planning on reacting uh, this time around? Are there things that you've learned for the first time 
that you would do differently? Or um, are you going to basically do the same thing you did before? Yeah, good question. Um, so I don't think it's going to be nearly as significant for us this time. So first of all, we've been anticipating this. We've been anticipating that this is going to ebb and flow. You know, once Newsom introduced the tier system, you know, we, we knew that this was going to be a constant ebb and flow. So we've been anticipating it. And it's one of the main reasons we've been putting together these other initiatives, right? To make sure that even if that happens, we can still keep people on and we can still operate. Um, very different than when this first happened. You know, when this first happened, we had no choice but to furlough everyone. I think it was the right thing to do. We reacted very quickly, um, but that really allowed the company to then kind of, you know, innovate and come up with these other ideas. This time, because our patios have so many seats, a lot of our restaurants, I mean, we had a handful of restaurants and, you know, maybe five or seven of our 39, believe it or not, that even with dining rooms closed are doing better than they did this time last year with dining rooms open. And so um, it's interesting because we, we think it's in part um, we've got so much space now on the patio, right? When we first closed down, we just had our, whatever our patios were that we had in the restaurant. And then you had to have every other table, right? Because they had to be six feet apart. We have so much space and we have tents and we have heaters in almost all of our parking lots that the capacity that we now have outside is so significantly uh, bigger than it was last time, right? So this time, I think honestly, it's less of an issue for that reason. And then we have these other initiatives, the TV dinners, those still need to be prepped, cooked, put together. We have the takeout that we've grown. Our takeout business has doubled when, from when COVID started and we weren't focusing on it. So I don't think this time it's going to be a significant impact for us. Um, it's not good and it will take us back. You know, Two steps forward, one step back is the best way I could describe what's been happening. But it's nothing like what we went through in March and April when we, we had to furlough everybody. So, um, I, I'm, I'm thankful that we've got the patio dining up and running. The, the area that we're probably the most concerned is not California because it's a pretty strong weather state, but in places like Illinois, um, Virginia, where you know there's gonna be plenty of months when people don't wanna sit out on the patio with a heater because it's gonna be snowing, um, that's when we'll probably feel it the most. But right now in California, we've got enough outdoor dining. And it's interesting because we're, we're seeing a lot of traffic. I mean, a lot of our restaurants are on a wait um, and I think part of it is a lot of other restaurants have closed, right? So there's, there's from a sad, you know, the restaurant industry was maybe somewhat saturated prior to COVID. A lot of restaurants have closed their doors permanently and some have just closed right now just to not deal with it. Some have closed because of COVID cases and they're kind of waiting to work through that. Um, and as terrible as all of those things are, I, I think it's actually driving more traffic to restaurants like Lazy Dog. Thank you. We have a question from Robert that asks, what's the most rewarding aspect of your role? Um, gosh, great question. I would say helping people, helping our teammates. I, I was so incredibly uh, proud to be part of Lazy Dog as we went through this because of the way we treated our teammates and because of how well we took care of them. Um, and that's really rewarding. For me, it's important to work with a company that I'm proud to work with and that I can go to my friends and my family and say, hey, look at what Lazy Dog is doing. And when we were doing the family meals and the donate a meal, I mean, restaurants were, you know, laying people off and closing their doors and we were giving away food. And even the pantry kits were, I mean, I think for $30, you got all of the stuff that you saw in there. And we were also giving that to our teammates who needed it. Mm -hmm. So our teammates. So um, for me, it's the most rewarding part is just doing the right thing and helping people and seeing the benefit of that. 